first Sunday of Advent, uh, the first Sunday of Advent is, um, we have 29 days. I don't know if you guys did the math yet because uh, 29 days from today until Christmas. So I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Like how much, how much uh, can happen in 29 days? Like it just, I know for a lot of us, uh, some people say 29 days, you can make a habit in 30 days. Some people say it's 60, some people say 90, but you can start, you know, get a good chunk of the habit. Um, so much of life in the next 29 days could change. I know we'll have a bunch of students, their lives will, will, they will be different. Their lives will be different in 29 days. Some of them will graduate, some of them will move out of Duluth, some will move to another state, another, uh, another city. Um, we have some students who in 29 days, they'll, they'll be engaged. Others, uh, in 29 days, there's the countdown, they'll be married. In 29 days, so much of life could change. Um, in 29 days, uh, you might meet the person, right? You might meet that person you're gonna end up marrying. In the next 29 days, you could go through a heartbreak. In the next 29 days, you might enter into one of the worst seasons of your life. So much of life, so much life will happen in the next 29 days. And there's so much, and yet, here's the thing, so much can happen in the next 29 days, and yet we could miss it. That, that we can miss out on the most important parts, the most important things. And one of the reasons is because we're so busy. These next 29 days are so full of, like for our students, they're full of uh, projects, they're full of papers, they're full of parties. For, for those of you who are not in school, um, it's basically all the things you normally have to do, plus everything else and getting ready for Christmas, plus everything else and getting ready for, for family and everything else and getting ready for all the other things that are happening. Our lives can be so busy that we can miss life in the next 29 days. So I wanna share something, um, and this might be dumb, this might be stupid, it might be uh, super obvious, and you, for you it might even seem really, really small. Um, but this is just something I, I, I will regularly lose sleep over, and in fact, most nights I will lose sleep um, asking God this question. Um, and it's a question that goes through my mind every time we have Mass on campus on Sundays, every time we have Mass in the cathedral, and I'm just praying and looking out over all the students. Um, and the question is, it comes back to this, I just like, I'm, I'm looking out going, God, what do they need? Again, I'm lying in bed, just like, God, what do they need? Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what to say. I'm saying, God, what do you need me to say? What do they need me to say? What do they need to hear? God, what do they need? And the answer keeps coming back all the time is God says, well, Jesus. <laughs> and so God is speaking interiorly to me saying, well, they need me. And I don't want to be rude and I don't want to be make this, you know, I don't talk to God like this, but I'm kind of like, well, yeah, duh, God. <laughs> like, I know this. Um, but like, what do they need to know about you? Like, what is it, what is it about you that they need? And recently, God has been just kind of just moving at my heart. And he's like, no, 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 not about me. They need me. Not what they need to know about me. They just need me. So I've been struck by this so much. Um, I wonder how many of us, I wonder how many of us, our relationship with God, you might say, is like secondhand. You have this secondhand relationship with God where uh, we come to Mass in order to hear about someone else, someone else's experience with God. We come to Mass in order to hear about someone else's encounter with God. We come to Mass to hear about someone else's relationship with God. And so, yeah, if in a homily or in a sermon or some kind of talk, like someone can tell me about their relationship, then I'm like, okay, that's, that's good. Or someone else's relationship, that's good. And those things are good because they inspire us and they move us down the field. Sometimes you just come to Mass to hear the scriptures proclaimed and we hear about someone else's relationship with God, someone else's encounter with God. And those things are good. But how many of us have a firsthand relationship? How many of us are just living off of these secondhand relationships? How many of us are living actually off of your encounter, my encounter, like my relationship with God? And again, if I'm saying this, asking the question, I don't mean like in judgment way. I, I mean it just, and it's, it's very normal. It's really normal to keep showing up and to still feel kind of like, but it's not my relationship. In fact, Mother Teresa at one point, when she was alive, she was giving a, a retreat to a bunch of her sisters. And so these are nuns in a convent. These are women who have dedicated their entire lives, not only to the Lord, but they also spend time with the Lord. And Mother Teresa, she was struck by the same kind of question, that same question of, do you have a second-hand relationship with God or do you have a first-hand relationship with God? And she said these words. She said, I worry. She said, I worry that some of you, she's talking to nuns now. She said, I worry that some of you still have not really met Jesus. One-to-one. -one. You and him alone. 
Jesus wants me to tell you again how much is the love he has for each one of you. Beyond all that you can imagine, we may spend time in the chapel, but have you seen with the eyes of your soul how he looks at you with love? She asked the question, she said, do you really know the living Jesus, not from books, but from being with him in your heart? Have you heard the loving words he speaks to you? And then she said, never give up on this daily intimate contact with Jesus as a real living person, not just as an idea. And the reality, of course, is that sometimes we don't have a first-hand relationship because it seems like it's God's so easy to miss. Because it can seem so difficult because I wonder if maybe we're missing something right in front of us these next 29 days, if we'll be missing something right in front of us. So there's the story of, of I mentioned this two weeks ago, the story of Jacob and Esau, the two twin brothers, right? The, the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Um, twin brothers, Esau was the oldest, so he naturally had a right to the birthright and to the blessing. Now, we heard two weeks ago how Jacob was made the red stuff and Esau came in from the field and he said, give me some of the red stuff. And Jacob said, I'll give you the red stuff if you give me your birthright. And so uh, he says, fine, you can have my birthright. Give me the red stuff, make that exchange. Later on, uh, Jacob deceives his dying and blind father, Isaac, by pretending to be Esau and he receives the blessing. And so he steals the blessing, essentially. He, he you know, tricks, not tricks, but he exchanges the birthright for some stew. And then he tricks his father to give him the blessing. Esau finds out about this and he literally wants to kill his brother, Jacob. So Jacob has to run into the, into the wilderness. Jacob goes into the wilderness, and this is Genesis chapter 28. Jacob, on the run from his brother, who's trying to kill him, he goes to a place called Bethel. And at Bethel, uh, he lay down to sleep. And this is kind of remarkable, because here's the part that's remarkable to me. He said, um, taking one of the stones at the shrine, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep at the spot. So he used a stone as a pillow, which I just, I don't know, just strikes me as being weird. Anyways, he goes to sleep. <laughs> that wasn't remarkable. What happens next is remarkable. He goes to sleep. He says this, then he had a dream, a stairway that rested on the ground with his top reaching to the heavens. And God's messengers were going up and down on it. God's angels going up and down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him saying, I am the Lord. I am the God of your forefather Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you are lying, I will give you and your descendants. Know that I am with you, he says. I will protect you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will never leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob wakes up. And he utters these words after he has this image, this vision, this recognition that God is here. He says these words. He says, God was in this place and I did not know it. God was here and I didn't know it. This is one of the things we, we, we always fall into this trap. In 29 days, we can be so busy, our lives can be so full, God can be so close and we don't even know it. And that's the truth. The truth is God is not distant. The truth is God is not far off. The truth is he is closer than you think. And so that's, that's, that's our series for the next four weeks. That's what we're going to be focusing on, that God is closer than you think. For the next 29 days, we're highlighting this, this reality, this truth, that he is closer than you think. Because this is the series for Advent. Again, Advent is what? It's a, it's a time of preparation, right? It's pre preparing either to celebrate the first coming of Jesus in the Nativity, Christmas, or it's time preparing for the final coming of Jesus at the end of the world, right? These are the two comings of Christ, the first coming of Christ at Christmas and the final coming of Christ in glory at the end of time. But saints have always talked about there's this middle coming of Jesus. And this middle coming of Jesus is the fact that he continues to come to us now, that he continues to come to us in the spirit and he continues to come to us in the Eucharist. And so, yes, we're going to spend 29 days preparing to celebrate the first coming of Jesus and preparing to enter into the final coming of Jesus. Those, that's in the past and that's in the future. We want to live now. The only time we can live is now. The only place we can live is here. So we have to recognize that God is also now. God is also here and God is closer than you think. And again, if we miss this over the next 29 days, we could miss everything because we don't know. We have, that's why Jesus says we have to stay awake because he's basically saying, you can't miss this. In these next 29 days, you can't miss this. You can't afford to. You know, again, at the same time, I realize people have said, but it's so busy, Father. You have no idea. We just said it is the busy season. If there's any busier time in people's lives, like across the board, I don't know what it is. 
that not only is this a possibly a busy time, this also can be a really, really difficult time for so many people. And I get that, like I completely understand that, but that's how life goes. That's just life. Life is busy. Life is difficult. But God is closer than you think. And we can't wait for things to be perfect in order to find him in it. I mean, even think about the first reading. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 2. And, and what does Isaiah say in, the, in this in the, second re- in the first reading, he says, In days to come, the mountains of the Lord's house, which is Zion, right, Jerusalem, shall be established as the highest mountain. In days to come, he says, all nations will stream towards this place. They'll come into Jerusalem. He says, ever all people shall come and say, come, let us climb, cl- let us climb the Lord's mountain. He says, the day will come when we'll beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, right? We, there'll be a time of peace, basically, what he's saying. And he says, okay, this is coming. This is what's going to happen. Prepare for this. Look forward to this. But I don't know if you know this. Do you know the next thing that happens to the people of Israel? Isaiah is saying, this is what's going to happen. Everyone's going to come to Jerusalem. It's going to be this great place of worship, a great place of encounter with the Lord. It'll be a place of peace. The next thing that happens to Israel is Babylon comes into Jerusalem. They besiege Jerusalem. They starve the people there. They beat them. They kill many of them. And they exile the rest. That's the next thing that's happening to the people in Jerusalem, the people that Isaiah, today in the first reading, is writing to. It was one of the worst chapters in the history of a people who have a lot of chapters that are really dark and really difficult. But Isaiah is saying, even in this, he's here. Even in this time that is not perfect, even in this time that is one of the darkest moments you could ever imagine, he's here. He's close. Now, don't miss it. Don't miss him. And here's the thing, I don't want you, I don't want myself to miss him either. Because things could be different in 29 days. But it's going to cost something. It's going to take 29 days of decision. To realize that God is closer than we think it's going to take 29 days of a decision. I first met Tom a few years ago when he was in the federal prison here in Duluth. And uh, back in 2008, with the market crash, housing crash, everything, all the bubble, everything that went down, the housing schemes and Ponzi schemes, um, you know, the biggest, most powerful people, they didn't go to jail. Many of them didn't. But uh, the small people, the little guys, uh, who maybe sometimes didn't even know what was going on, they got to be the scapegoats. And Tom was one of the scapegoats. And uh, Remember him saying, yeah, they could just say, throw him in prison, ruin his life, who cares? His reputation was destroyed. Um, his family was devastated, obviously. And, and Tom said this, he said, he said, that can happen to a person. He says, one walks away bitter and angry. Someone can walk away from the whole experience. Here you are, blamed for all these things that he, again, didn't necessarily have a ton of responsibility for, but blamed for it. Reputation destroyed, family devastated, sent to federal prison for years and years. And he says, one walks away bitter and angry. And he said, I walked away with so much gratitude. He said, it cost me everything, but it's been worth every single tear. Why? Because he said, uh, it gave me the opportunity to lay down my life. It gave me the opportunity to spend my time with Jesus and the Eucharist. And he said, it gave me the opportunity to raise up an army of adorers of Jesus and the Eucharist in the prison. So he described it, what life was like in the prison. That in the prison, there's a shared chapel. And that shared chapel, was, it was shared with 12 other like, religions, including Satanism. So they had, this is a place where they would have mass. It would also be a place where, right next door where they'd have like, witchcraft things. But in that chapel, right, in the loft above this chapel, they have a tabernacle. They have where Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. And Tom said he spent, I think in the years he was in prison, he said he spent something like 15,000 hours with his arms wrapped around the tabernacle. His arms wrapped around Jesus. Begging the Lord, like, Lord, raise up. Raise up an army of adorers, people who know you're truly present here, and will love you and will adore you. At one point, Tom told the story of uh, this man named Rick. Uh, Rick uh, was, Rick had been a a 40-year meth addict. Rick had been in the Hells Angels. 
Rick had lived a hard life. And in the Hells Angels, there was murder, there was all the other things that go on with being, he, Rick was a rough guy, he was a tough guy. He'd been in Leavenworth for like 12 to 14 years. And when he was moved, got moved to Duluth, he was uh, Tom's cellmate for like two days as he was being processed and then he moved on. And But Rick, uh, Rick at one point, came up to, to Tom and he said, Tom, I've been watching you. <laughs> Imagine if one of the former Hells Angels comes up and he says, I've been watching you. I'm like, okay, maybe not so much. Um, Rick was about 62 years old at the time. Tom, I've been watching you. And he says, I've been reading the Bible. He says, I've been going to Bible studies, bopping in and out of this one and that one. And I've been trying to get close to the Lord. But see, he says, and I've been studying the Bible because he'd been in jail for a long time reading the Bible. He said, I've been studying the Bible for a long time, but you have something, Tom, I've never seen before. He said, you have something, Tom, that I want. And he said, how do I get it? And at this point, Tom realized, he said, okay, so even though Rick has been in jail for 12 to 14 years, he's getting out in six months. And so he's like, okay, I don't have any time to waste. And he even says this to Rick. He says, like, listen, Rick, I'm, I could take you through some Bible studies. I could teach you the catechism. I'm not going to do any of those things because it would just be a waste of my time. <laughs> And, um, and I don't want you to waste my time. And he said, Rick looked at him. Again, this, this man who's lived a whole life, right? Here's Tom in prison for like some money stuff. Here's another man in prison for way worse stuff. Um, other kinds of things, we'll say. He looks at him like he's crazy. And Tom says, listen, I don't want to waste my time just arguing about the Bible with you or talking points of the catechism with you. He said this, he said, um, if you really want to know what I have that you don't have. He says, how badly do you want to know this? How badly do you want this thing that I have? And, and uh, Rick says, I, I want it real so badly. He says, okay, then here's what you're gonna do. He says, if you're willing to win this, if you're willing to, to do this thing, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna shut up you're gonna do what I say. Again, I can't believe that he said this, but this is, that's, you know, whatever, however you talk to people, I don't do that. <laughs> So, okay, fine. He said, okay, I want you to open your Bible to John chapter 6 in verse 51. What does it tell, what does it say? Rick opens his Bible, John chapter 6, verse 51. He says, read it to me. And the verse is, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. He says, Rick, what does that mean? Rick says, I don't know. He says, that's your problem. <laughs> you don't know what it means. So here's what you're going to do. Every day for the next 30 days, you're going to go into the chapel. And in that tabernacle, that is Jesus, the living bread come down from heaven. And every day for the next 30 days, you're going to spend one hour in silence in Jesus' presence. That's what, that's what I need you to do. And you're going to tell me when you do it, and I will look in, and I'll make sure you're there. And if you're not there one day, I'm done. You're done. I'm out. <laughs> Are you willing to do this? And Rick was like, yes. He's like, okay. Now, the first time you do this, I'm going to be with you. And so they did this. They went to the chapel in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. He said, now, here's the thing, Rick. I need you to beg Jesus to reveal himself to you. That's what your prayer is. To beg Jesus. And not like, oh, this is kind of the prayer I'm supposed to pray. But if you want this change, you want this thing to happen in your life, to beg Jesus to reveal himself to you. So we led him through this prayer and said, okay, now for the next 30 days, one hour every single day. And again, he'd check on him and everything. Uh, Tom said on day 27, there's, it, the, the, the compound of the federal prison is like a 90-acre compound with a lot of outdoor space. On day 27, he said, this 62-year-old man is running across the compound like an eight-year-old boy sobbing, saying, where's Tom? Where's Tom? Where's Tom? He finds Tom. And he says, Tom, he revealed himself to me. Like he showed himself to me. And he didn't just like hold on to me like, like you shake someone's hand. He said, he wrapped, he took my heart and he held my heart. I know him. After 27 days, Rick's life was completely changed. That year he entered into RCIA. Bishop Serba, before he passed, confirmed Rick, gave him First Holy Communion, brought him into the church. And Tom even shared a letter that Rick had written to him after the fact, after he got out. He said, my life has never has, has never been this great. He's never experienced such transformation, never experienced such freedom, never experienced such closeness with the Lord. That all happened in 27 days. So here's the challenge. Here's the invitation. Tom said, Rick, 30 days, one hour every day. We have 29 days. So I'm going to say 29 minutes for 29 days. 
starting today, 29 minutes for 29 days. For the next 29 days, I'm going to invite every single person. If you want, if you want Jesus, if you want not, in 29 days, we'll be different. Either we'll be different in the same, same way or we'll be different in the sense we'll be closer to Jesus because if nothing changes, then nothing changes. I don't want any of us to have a second-hand relationship with Jesus and I know that you don't want to have a second-hand relationship with Jesus either. Either So for 29 minutes every single day for the next 29 days, I'm not saying just read your Bible. I'm not saying find a quiet place in your house. I'm saying go to the church and be in front of Jesus in the tabernacle, be in front of Jesus in the Eucharist and beg him to reveal himself to you and sit there in silence. Don't listen to music. I'm inviting you to not listen to anything else. Don't listen to anyone's talks or another sermon, but to go into the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and say, God, reveal yourself to me. You're made to have a first-hand relationship with Jesus. You're not made to have a second-hand relationship with Jesus. He wants you to know him. I'm inviting every one of our students to do this as well. You know, in this chapel, in this chapel, um, for our students, the front row is five feet from Jesus. God is closer than you think. So you get to draw close to him. 29 minutes. Every 29 days. The invitation and the challenge. Get close to Jesus. Because he is closer than you think.